Excellent. Um, all right, today we are interviewing the prolific artist, Robert Owens. And when I say prolific, I mean like seriously prolific. Um, our last Thank interview you. was with, um, <laughs> with um, Leroy Burgess, who is one of the Amazing few people who may be even more prolific than Robert. Um, if you know it really goes back so much further. But I, th I thought for our second, Robert is absolutely just that guy. Um, Thank you for having me here. Oh, thanks for being here. Uh, I took mm -hmm. a very, very quick look, perusal, um, at your uh, stuff that you had on Spotify. Mm -hmm. You had like 60 odd singles, you got like maybe nine albums, and we all know that Spotify doesn't necessarily carry everything that every, that every artist did, so yeah. there's a lot that's still missing. And then when I looked up Fingers Incorporated, I found mm -hmm. that there were maybe two things and definitely not even touching, scratching the surface of you guys' work. So mm -hmm. I say yeah. all this to say... You've got so much. You, 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 you yes, if you go so to track much. source of Bport, it's over a thousand things there. Ah, ha! Yeah. I came to the right place. See? Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for validating my choice, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so much more than that there in the whole discography oh, catalog. Man. And you just said that you were, you're going back stuff, in the studio, you know? or you're you're in the in and out. I'm of in studio. the studio tomorrow. Almost every weekend, uh, uh, every week, I'm in the studio, maybe two or three times. You know, and I think it's been a, a real blessing. Um, even during this whole pandemic and scare mongering amongst uh, us humans, um, it's been a blessing to connect with a lot of artists around the world globally. You know, um, sure. the internet allows you to do that digitally. I can still interact with people, and you know, I'm, I'm physically there for um, where people can contact me. You know, on a lot of these medias like Instagram. Or, Facebook and so on and you know I'm, and I, I just talk to people in general and if I get a good vibe from you um, I've, I'll give you a chance you know and I've given a lot of young artists a, a chance you know and, and just trust it from you know a, a little conversation with them that um, I got inspired or they got inspired um, from something they heard and I just went in the studio and laid a vibe for him, you know. Nice. Well, I'd like to do some work with you at some point. So let me. Throw I'm my... here and available anytime, huh? I've long, known you longer than probably uh, a lot of the, the young ones that are approaching me. So. Absolutely. We go back yeah. to uh, just forever. And mm -hmm. I, I say to people a lot, um, Chip and Steve Hurley get a lot of the credit, and they deserve it, mm -hmm. for being. Mm -hmm. Um, two of the earliest house music artists. Mm -hmm. And except for Jamie and Jesse, largely they can hold themselves out as that. However, mm -hmm. I remember it was months before, I don't know how many months, two, three, four, five, um, mm -hmm. but Frankie was playing Mystery of Love at the power plant for, like I said, after Jesse mm -hmm. and Jamie, but several mm -hmm. months before Steve and, and Chip started bringing stuff down, and mm -hmm. so you guys literally go back to pretty much the beginning. There isn't a whole lot of anything that was happening before you and Larry got on the scene. And, and you know, with, with um, Ron Hardy, Frankie Knuckles, and Larry Levan and people like this, uh, I knew them and were catering the clubs before um, a lot of the whole house thing got popular even you go back to the den one um with oh, Ron sure. Hardy oh, and stuff. Yeah, please, please, tell us, before tell it actually us. closed i went back and rented i was living with frankie in um new york but i came back to visit chicago and i went back and rented out that place and hired ron to come play you know as homage sure. to him being an inspiration to me and you know a few of the heads there know that that you actually oh, came out tell, tell us what year you know that you know that um know from the scene and stuff you know because you had your frankie knuckles group and then you had your ron hardy group and every once in a while they all came together but um those were two of the guys that were really inspirational for me for the period before house even came into play sure absolutely you, you, you know so um they 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 and robert williams who you know exposed um them to a lot of the scene in the newer clubs like the music box and in the warehouse and stuff, you know, um, 
So Robert Williams definitely gets a big hands up. Uh, oh, for sure. I mean, Robert, know, you know, a lot of people don't know, know Robert was was Frankie's truant officer. So, um, you know, on <laughs> days New York that time, school, but... <laughs> Robert was knocking on the door. Uh, Mrs. Yeah. Knuckles, Frankie wasn't in school today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the New York, from um, the New York circuit, you know. It's, so it's you knew Larry career. as well. I mean, mm -hmm. Larry LeVan. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I didn't know him really close, close, but I got a chance to have personal conversations with him and talk to him. Okay. Points when I might have been in, in um, New York. And even when he first came to London, uh, uh, he was talking about me and him um, getting an apartment together. Did you and Frankie live together in New York? Oh, God, this was maybe about 85, 86 or something. Oh, wow, was, when he first moved out there. Um, yeah, so, no, I mean, he so he didn't move out there till like 87, was so 87? 87, 88, something like that. Maybe, yeah, it might have been, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm old now, forgive me, I get the years mixed <laughs> up, but it was before I moved to London, and I officially moved to London in 91. Okay. So the years right before that, I sure. was in New York, and cultivating the, probably your tears and all of this I'll mm -hmm. be in friend tracks and it was around that period. So yeah, it could have been like the late ending of the 80, 88 or 80, 87, 88, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Because yeah. as soon as I wrote the Tears track, he, they asked me to come and move to New York okay. and stay with them and become part of Death Mix. Sure, right, right, right. Oh, mm -hmm. so you were the vocalist for Death Mix initially. I want to say you were the... the, the... Uh, but did, who did the... They were doing projects, I think. I was probably one of their first in-house projects with, okay. that allowed them to do a, a full album. Sure, sure, sure. Now, who you know, was, so that, it was just at first Frankie, David, and was it Satoshi? Um, Satoshi, was he, he wasn't there yet. Okay. He came okay. during the period when I first came in. After, so after Tears, they got to deal with Fourth and Broadway, which gave them a chance to do the full mm -hmm. album. Mm -hmm. And that was on me. And then Satoshi came in. And I think that the Tears track triggered that for them to be That's... able to do that. Then they started doing all of the. They had been doing remixes, but a lot of the other remixes started coming in with Michael, um, Janet, Mariah, and all of this stuff mm -hmm. started coming in after that, you know. And then I think other personal albums start cultivating with them after that. Okay. Can you give, for the people who are not as knowledgeable, um, kind of a little dime store, bring them up to speed on, on, how, on your, your, your history in the industry. My history in the industry, God, uh, I can't, well, I've always been kind of in the Chicago circuit. Um, I've been DJing little small pubs and all of this kind of thing. Well, let's um, let's and, put years around this just so everybody can um, kind of be part of the and same And this concept. is where, you know, I might be misconstrued with some of the years here and there, but um, <laughs> we're talking <laughs> about um, probably early 80s and stuff um, mm -hmm. coming into where, hanging out and stuff. I said like maybe the Den one and a, a, a lot of the places up north, coconuts and all of this stuff that was mm -hmm. happening in the north side, just hanging out in the system and then coming into the actual system of meeting Frankie um, and them was a little later into the maybe um, late 80, 89, uh, uh, somewhere in the 80 period uh, when the warehouse was active downtown Chicago. Well, let's um, say 84. Five was when Mystery of Love, you guys brought that down to the power. Yeah. Well, before that, I was into the the circuit and, and DJing and stuff is where I met Frankie. Yes, because you were a DJ first. Yeah, I was DJing and stuff in little pubs and bars and stuff. Some um, high school, university parties. We mm -hmm. do parties in the dormitory. Then we rented out places and stuff. Um, and I was hanging out and knew Frankie and them then. And so during the course of me playing in these different places um um i met larry Hurd, and okay. um he some uh, someone brought him to one of my gigs i uh, vice versa and um then i think the next day i went over to his house and um he let me hear some of his music and i let him um um see some of the lyrics i had wrote and then i just instantly started matching words with um some of his music um i had initially already had like the um 
Mysteries of Love, Can You Feel It, Washing Machine, and all of these things okay. on cassette. And even Ron had got sick one time at the um, music box and they asked me to fill in. Oh, cool. And uh, Robert Williams asked me to fill in and I was playing the Mystery of Love and all of this stuff. And I just seen how people just got into this whole euphoric kind of feeling mm -hmm. uh, uh, around those tracks. And then I started giving Ron Hardy and Frankie Knuckles some of these tracks and stuff. And this um, broadened just um, my relationship and trust and probably a trust with them that I had, I was on to something with Larry with this music because they started playing different things. Even some things that I would put together with my own personal re-edits of mashups of things that were a combination maybe of just tracks or, or my vocals over tracks i would overdub things even back then we had the pitch wow. control pioneers um cassette decks mm -hmm. i probably Absolutely. had about three or four um tape the cassette decks hooked up and i would just overdub and overdub and i had different things like that some things that i gave um brian hardy and frankie and even well, my re-edits of about things like, even, uh, like your even, mind where where it was your mind that was something i did um, a path, a re-edit of the mm -hmm, path mm -hmm. that Frankie used to play. I did oh, that. Path was and, um, so huge at CODs. Yeah, I used to just bring a lot of different ideas to them and stuff. Even tracks that um I was playing where I might have found a, a loop sample of something, okay. and I, I I sampled it and played it, and they liked it, you know. But I, I just never was vocal about a lot of things that I was doing. It was like. Um, I always looked at us like family and stuff, you know, um, yeah. and we, you think in those early days of like the warehouse and the music box, a lot of people that were in that circuit knew each other and we just went back and forth to each other's house. It's almost like you skipped around, okay, this hour I'm going over Frankie's, so the next hour I'm heading over to Ron's, then right, so, right. So, you know, so that was like part of your routine. And they're like, what's Robert doing? What's Frankie doing? Everybody want to know what the other one doing. So. It was like a, a family, you know. Um, I agree. I agree. In that respect. Yeah. All right. So you and Robert got you and um you and Larry Larry Heard mm -hmm. got yeah. together. Like I said, it, it, I know that the Mystery of Love was was out in like '85. Um, like yeah. I said, this was months before mm -hmm. Chip and, well, and, and Steve. yeah, both. Well, his tracks came out first as um as um, just right. as instrumental tracks and then even with the can you feel it it was an instrumental track but when we finally got together and we decided to form a group you know mm -hmm. it just, one day we just decided as we were building and you know um i was more in the circuit with frankie and all of them mm -hmm. so yes. you know that that helped um because when they got interested it, it was like okay things started developing it um even more um with a lot of the tracks that we were using and playing um and we just decided to add vocals over the, uh, uh, the things that were instrumentals as well as things that we were developing as songs okay. that people like hadn't heard. We had a whole okay. pile of things that people still hadn't heard to date um, that were just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Some stuff I might have gave to um, people like Gene Hunt, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Kay Alexi. They, sure. they were there and coming around me a lot and stuff. So they would have had a lot of... Um, the experimental stuff at that period that we were right, developing right. and working on because and they were close was, to me. It really was experimental and like pushing the envelope mm -hmm. of music. Like mm -hmm. your mind mm -hmm. was is still is one of my favorites and it was faces drums, um mm -hmm. the part from some part from passion and then this trap that was it mm -hmm. was it was cold. It was just like something and I mean I remember when Ronnie would play it at the music box. Mm -hmm people would lose it, just lose mm. the shit. I was surprised. <laughs> kind of went for it. Because a, a lot of, even a pet, that's me overdubbing stuff, me, my vocal. Hmm. There's a lot of that overdubbed, and it's a few different beat tracks. It's a couple beat tracks from Larry, okay. but it, and it's a couple other beat tracks, um, that, and it's just a big mashup. Right, and right, right. I was exactly. actually really surprised that people just went for that. No, I mean, you guys really pushed the envelope for, for dance music and kind of mm. expanded what people can, before then might not mm. have considered music. And you guys mm. were like, no, we're, this is, and people are loving it. And now mm. the conversation has changed. And I, 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 I can't give you enough respect for that. Of yeah, just I'm grateful kind of to just be a part of the system, you know. Um, no, you were a blessing waiting, and, and you wanting not, to evolve. You were setting them, you know, mm. and that's a big deal. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And the whole really- thing of wanting to evolve with, you know, what was going on and not just um, accept that this is the way it is and this is the way it should be. Always trying to push the envelope, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. And your voice is like seriously one of the most recognizable in all of music. It's just, you know, either the the breathy part of it or that just soulful range that you've got. It's 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 beautiful. Mm, thank you. You're absolutely welcome. Mm. Um all right, so so you and you and Larry are starting to do stuff together. Yeah. Um, I mean, by the thing, thing, and then and comes in Damon DeCruz okay. um, from England, who decides. Well, no, well, who can um, DJ International came in um, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. to record some of the stuff, and um, a lot of people um, didn't even like a lot of the polished stuff that when we first started going to into the studios and doing things, they wanted more of the demo things, the raw things, and those were yeah. things that you know it was right on the spot where Larry Mike would call me, I would come over his house and it was instant. I would listen to something and I would be like, okay, I have words that will match this. Sure. And um, he, he, he's even said at one period that um, he couldn't get the same feel of reaction from things because I wasn't there. And at one time we were literally almost across the hall from each other where he could just knock on the door or around the corner from each other and he would call me up, I'd come around again. And I just sat there and listened and, and I was instant with a thought. Sure. And um, I was like, and, and at that period, um, in, in that period, we were just recording things right direct. Cause uh, back then a lot of artists, they were learning as they were going along. Yeah, a lot sure. of those units, you know, like the drum machines and stuff, 707, 808, so on and on, rolling stuff. They were learning as they were going along. So you, if you were in the room with the right person and I was kind of the ear that was out there in the system. Um, so when I heard something, it'd be like, yeah, that's it. I, I got it. Let's let's hit something quickly. And you record it. And some things, that was it. It wasn't no, uh, that was the blueprint. And that was all. If you didn't record it, you wouldn't have it. Oh, it's right. Like, I see what you're saying. You didn't necessarily know how to get back to that thing. No, that yeah, did. a lot of artists, you think they couldn't reduplicate everything they did. Maybe later. But at that, that particular time, it was spontaneous, right on the spot thing. But me lyrically, it's always been, I go from my first um, thought. Um, and I do, at present date, I do that even when people send me um, um, instrumentals to, for me to um, write them a lyrical content or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I just always go with my first reaction. And, and you know, to me, they works, so it doesn't work. You shouldn't second guess yourself or you shouldn't um, feel no stress about um, the whole creative process. You know, it's the wonderment and fascination of things that could come, the possibilities of what could happen. Sure. You know, you have to stay, you know, well, at least me, I try to keep that inspiration. And that um, comes from the past and the way um, I originally did it. You know, yeah. in the very beginning, you know, I always keep that open mind about things and try to give that the same sensibility, uh, thought pattern and a process to other artists that I meet and I'm working with. That, you know, you should never have to stress yourself out. You should really enjoy to just to just think of what could happen. If something makes you feel good nine times out of ten, it may make someone else feel good as well. Hmm. Okay, good way of looking at things. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's funny that you say that you're right. Sometimes it's a viewpoint. <laughs> Again. So yeah, I, 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 I yeah, that that that's really a, a, a interesting perspective. Like. Mm-hmm. Those initial demo versions sometimes were so strong because mm-hmm. it was just them trying something new and they may not know how they got there because they were learning at the time. It's not like they had mm-hmm. this great breadth of knowledge and then they said, okay, mm-hmm. now let's try this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you yeah. know, honestly, some demo things that I hear, in fact, a lot of times, mm-hmm. the polished version of it is not as much fun and does not yeah. provide that same mm. energy and and, mm. and you know that magic that studio magic mm-hmm. once you the second time or third or fifth mm. time around once you got it down you're polished mm. you know you're sending out the polished version i still to this day ask chip about mm. the original version of of, of like this mm. it, it was that was the one you know mm. and, and, and lots mm. of other initial demo mm. raw versions those are the ones that have that mm. that, that that captured the lightning in the bottle mm. once you guys figured it out mm. 
it was it, well, it reverts like, back to the whole um thought that house music is a feeling it's not all yeah. about you know um uh, how much money you throw at it it's about the feeling you know um, sure. right. you know and in the um the unification of whoever you're in that room with structuring something you hit a magical moment right then and there you both you hit them ah moments even to date if i'm in the studio with one or two people at some point where we do something everybody goes ah yes <laughs> so, yeah yeah you know if you hit that moment it, it, collectively you don't destroy that and, and you pray you know, that you captured it you know that yeah, somebody and this it. is where people make they um uh, mistake of over processing and overdoing something I exactly. always keep a, a blueprint of your first original format a pattern or something yeah. and then you can do a million other me remixes around that but never lose your your blueprint of something i agree i wholeheartedly agree mm. all right so like i said you 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 moved to new york it's 90 something and mm -hmm. where do we go from there um, well, moved to New York probably um, in the 89, 90s, 87, six, somewhere in there. Um, and joined Def Mix and I started working with them, start playing clubs there. Okay. Um, I had been previously going there before doing like Paradise Garage, um, Zanzibar, Latin Quarters I even done. I did Louis, Louis um, Baker probably was one of the first people to bring me there. Me and Lolita did a show together with him. Okay. Um, I you, did you, you say you performed at the garage? Uh, yeah, Paradise Garage a lot of times. I performed there. Wow, a lot of times. Yeah. Tell, tell, tell us what that was like. Um, you, really, you know, really and, and let me say something. You just gloss over shit like, oh yeah, you know, several times, you know, like, like, like somebody said, and then I went and got some ice cream and you know, the watermelon is lovely. I mean, no, dude, you, you need to, talk like that's a big deal because uh, it is okay so tell us what uh, it was like working with larry and, and performing at the garage of uh, the garage god it was mind-blowing just being there um yeah i'm such an amazing place um and um god it's hard to describe the feeling of you, you just knew a lot of iconic artists was there and um sure. just um the whole beauty of the club and um the sound system, how it, it felt like it covered your whole body from toes to head, you know, when, when you just stood on the dance floor listening to that sound system. But um, just the feeling that you got from the, the crowd there in general in New York, probably in any club, you know, um, it's almost just out of body experience even mm -hmm. <laughs> right. from one perspective um, because you kind of like just in a daze that, that you there, I think it, it with performing in, in general, you know, um, um, I never, and, and just really thinking about it, I never really fully tried to think about how it makes me feel. I always thought about um, how I'm making others feel. Okay. Uh, it's always getting around to the emphasis of um, being an entertainer. I came here to entertain. Sure. So I'm always more focused on, okay, I'm, um, how how am I gonna am I gonna get on the level of this crowd? Um, and maybe too, um, because uh, I haven't just been um, a, a stage performer. I've also been a DJ. So mm -hmm. you know, you're coming to these situations where you're coming into other countries, um, other cities, and your first reaction is, okay, how can I get on the level with this crowd? Mm -hmm. So you've hit me from the other way around. I actually never thought about that. Hmm. Um, I've always thought about it the way that I'm explaining to you is I'm, my objective is to go in here and make these people happy, uh, entertain them. Exactly. And often I've been in situations where it looked like they wanted to kill you as soon as you came <laughs> onto the stage. And so you're at first, uh, um, maybe 10 minutes is trying to relax into, okay, mm. uh, are, are we getting there? Uh, am I losing the sense of uh, um, them against me? Are, are, are we unifying here yet? Okay. And then once you reach that point where it, it feels like, okay, um, we on a level. Now I can entertain them. You feel like, ah. And, I, you know, I feel like I've been really lucky and fortunate um, looking at it from that um, angle um, just to be able to go around the world globally. And, and New York was one of the first places, like I said, with Louie and stuff. And then having mentors like Lolita and and 
a Jocelyn Brown and different people like in the sure. dressing room speaking to them and talking to them, I would hear a lot about their experiences and what they overcame and stuff. Um, so I was probably caught up into that whole euphoria of being around the whole everything, you know, involved in the, those periods too, because um, a lot of times I was around big artists like that. I've opened for Grace Jones and, and been mm -hmm. close with her brother, Chris and stuff. Um, okay. So um, it embodied a lot more than me just thinking of it from the other perspective. Hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're in New York and you are mm -hmm. hobnobbing with um, everybody. And mm -hmm. then you decide to move to uh, the UK. Did you, you move to London? Mm -hmm. Yes, I moved to London. I had been going back and forth with dates with Fingers Inc. Then they start um, asking me to come near um, some solo dates. And then eventually they just asked me, they just said, you got to just move here. <laughs> so, so was Larry um, living there at the time? Um, no, Larry was in Chicago. And then after he, we had broke up and um, went, he went solo and stuff. Okay. Um, um, I think he moved to Memphis after that. So we weren't really in touch uh, uh, a lot of, uh, when um, I had officially moved to um, England. Okay. But um, when I finally officially moved there, a, a record label, Freetown Records, asked mm -hmm. me to come and do a and r for their label. Okay. And so that, uh, I had been going back and forth, but to officially finally move there, that was the reason that I finally moved there. Interesting. Um, so you, the, so you the were... Freetown label, um, he asked me to, and I was surprised. And I was like, oh, I'll give it a shot. I never did it. But um, me being based in London, um, I started going out around to clubs there and scout, um, scouting talent. And mm -hmm. I put together um, an in-house um, band team of people for studio mus um, musicians and everything for this company. Um, sure. And they just gave me a, a, a free run of it the guy just was loaded and it's like he just felt a love for me and trusted me and i was like um really overwhelmed it felt okay i got to really do well here and things just um kind of flowed and fell in place i put together a choir for them did showcases oh, wow. and different things cool. um it's a shame i lost a lot of the footage from a lot of those things but again it's people you know somewhere and in this world, it realized these things happen and stuff. Uh, right. But me being based there too, um, people in Italy, um, France, Germany, all over Europe started finding out that I was based there. And by me being only one or two hours away from um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, most of the cities and neighboring cities and countries and stuff, they would started flying me in and out. So my schedule was just like, whoosh. I just, uh, it was overwhelming, you know, the amount of work and things that I was doing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would sleep in the, after coming, flying back in from maybe a date in Italy or somewhere, um, right back to the studio to tr train a vocalist or write a song for a vocalist, see what they were doing, restructure, developing things and stuff for this label. And it, it was, you know, a period where I could look back and say, wow, you know, that happened, you know. No, that's very interesting. For mm. people who don't know, A&R is what's known as artisan repertoire. And mm. it's basically being a talent scout for um, record labels. And it's kind of mm. not just finding their new and next project and, and, and that, mm. but also to some extent working with artists and, and developing mm. how that song is going to work in the studio. And mm. so largely A&R people are ones that can help a label have an identity because they're having mm. in direct influence on who mm. the new artists that are performing on that label are going to be. Um, mm, thank you so for it, bringing it is, you know, kind of a, 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 a it's a big deal role. Mm. Um, you're pitching, you know, constantly saying, hey, I think this is, is the next big thing or somebody who's really a, a talented addition mm. and then pitching their work to yeah. the higher ups that say, yes, I think we should get this person in or no, I don't know mm. that they're the direction we want to be in or what have you. So, mm. um, so it's an interesting hat to wear in the industry, considering that yes. you had been a DJ yes. already. Mm. Now you had done some of the production with, um, with fingers or, or, or were you? Um, I, um, I remixed a couple of things that we did okay. and stuff. Yeah. Um, and more like um, hands-on and developing certain things and stuff. Okay. 
Now, when you were with and Def, Def, all of mo- the maturity of the writing and stuff, that was all me. Okay, okay, okay. So, as a writer, as a songwriter and vocalist, you were mm-hmm. you had some hand in some productions. Were yeah. you doing some of that with um with Def Mix? With Def Mix, no, it was more me just being a, a vocalist in the Def Def with the Def Def Mix scenario. Sure. So an in-house uh, writer produce in in-house yeah. writer per, writer yeah, writer writer and the, the vocalist here. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I wrote um all of the songs that I did well on the Def Mix thing. Yeah, I wrote nice. all of that. Okay. And then you have you have moved from New York and you're mm-hmm. in London. And mm-hmm. since labels and, 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 and different entities realize that you're not across the pond, but you're, mm-hmm. you know, a, a ride on the Trans-Europe Express away, you mm-hmm. know, they can kind of get access to you a lot more easily than you would prior been in New York. So mm-hmm. a lot of work starts coming in for you. Yeah, yeah. And then working with a lot of the artists abroad developed from that because um, just say if I was in Italy, um, for two or three days and it was some producer there that um was familiar with the work you know and we just built a report it's like okay let's go in the studio sure, right. <laughs> One project, another project comes and something would pop up yeah you know because um i wasn't um like restricted to like no set deal uh, the only times probably it was a restriction was if it was a major label deal like with uh RCA or Sony or, or some of these big fourth and Broadway. When when you're on like those kind of deals, you're restricted to uh, limited to what you can do. But um, oh, how so? Like like what what, what might be that's, something? There are usually clauses work. in the contract that you can't do this or that and other. Uh, but well, when like, on like, independent, you, you have like a free that. scope of what you can do. Or if you're running your own individual in, individual label, often you can do projects through your label and just license them on to territories and different sure, things. Course, so course. it's all the way things are set up and structured. But a lot of um, when major labels, they try to really lock you in with a team so, and it and don't allow so you to so do. If RCA or Sony did a project with you, you're saying that they might say for six months you couldn't do we couldn't record with another entity or what you know, would be how, some how clauses you, like that could. Be, Okay. could be in the contract and you have to re- renegotiate time limit and different things uh, territory and stuff like yeah, that yeah yeah sure sure i'm i'm in, I, for for those who don't know i'm also an entertainment lawyer so um you know mm-hmm. we, we 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 can talk this stuff and i'm i try to bring other people into the conversation so mm-hmm. that you know it's not just something that me and artists can talk about but you know joe mm-hmm. schmo also has a little bit of uh, yeah, familiarity yeah. with this kind of thing yeah. Um, all right, so it is at this point where, like, late nineties, mid nineties. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'd stayed in London for over twenty years. Yeah, you were like, a, yeah. were you, were you in Blackbriar, or am I getting that wrong? With this? I've oh. lived in Hampstead. I've lived in Kensington. I've lived in Maida Vale. I've lived in um, Dorston. Um, Probably Dalston, Stoke Newington was the last area, okay. and then and from the era, not been to London except on yeah. a layover, right over my head. Yeah. Well, um, some of the <laughs> these, these are like the key <laughs> prime, all the key prime areas oh, that nice. you okay. would want to be in in England. Gotcha. Those so were you weren't, like you weren't top, top. living out there. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's, there's still, I'm still in contact with loads of people in London. Um, I'm booked for loads of festivals and stuff coming up in London. They're the first people just kicked off to get me. Um, and even in Europe, it's places that I've had to cancel dates because of this whole Corona madness and stuff. Um, sure. Luckily, I haven't had it. <laughs> Thank God. I, I keep going and testing and all of this stuff. Have you, have you been um, vaccinated? No, I'm on the list for it. You know, I said I might as well do it um, yeah. just because of all of the bookings that's coming up and traveling. Exactly. Still, yeah, it opens yeah. a lot of things up for you. Yeah. But I've still been doing loads of live streams. And um, I just did the first open air here in Berlin um, Monday, which okay. is really nice to see people out. And, you know, we are, everybody had to take the test before you entered the, um, mm-hmm. this outdoor venue and stuff but just to see a lot of people out and them to listen to music you had to sit down but you you see every once in a while people with their hands in the air ah, yeah. right, right, <laughs> and certain songs it did a few people might stand up and try to dance for a minute then they sat down but it was like a restaurant type scenario but uh outdoor mm, okay. thing along the lake and and stuff 
it's a really beautiful place here called Sage Beach. Hmm. Um, and, you know, so that was really, really nice and inspiring. Um, because for me, one of my greatest feelings is seeing a collective of people all together happy. Sure. And, absolutely. you know, so even, you know, doing the stage thing and that we were talking about early and my first reactions is about getting people on that one accord, one um, level where you think, OK, now we're all together. Let's enjoy this ride, you know, so and it's the same principle, you know, um, doing the live thing. So I'm looking. I'm looking forward to a lot of the dates that are booked to come up and fingers crossed nothing happens. Huh? And just being grateful that loads of people still want to book me, um, you know. Oh, dude, and I mean, you're, you, you've got an amazing set of pipes and, and your your ability to be that creative force is, un, it's, it's unquestionable. So, you know, who wouldn't want to work with you? Mm, but you gotta keep it, keep that thing of like, I'm grateful. <laughs> I agree. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, the the people that I find have are, are the most accomplished tend mm -hmm. to be the most humble. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've, I've, I've known some of the really high level folks. Frankie was my mm -hmm. mentor. You and I have been mm -hmm. friends since forever. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you guys, you know, are just seriously like the, I, 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 the thing that I always got from Frankie was that, um, you know, like, people would just be like, you are just a, a god. And he was like, me? Thanks. And you've, you've always Grandfather. Been... Yeah. Godfather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I mean, so, so I say this to say, it's, it's not surprising mm. to me, your humility. Mm. Um, mm. But I think to a lot of other people, yeah, it, it probably is a, mm. a thing. But like I said, I, I find that the, the nicest the nicest people tend to be the most accomplished. Mm -hmm. you know, those mm -hmm. who are just, they they are just drunk on their own power. Mm -hmm. They're trying to be somebody, but they're not mm -hmm. really that. Yeah. Old. Now you can't forget your roots. You can't forget, you know, that well, people absolutely. put you in whatever position that you achieve in this industry. And, you know, that's always something that's really poignant right there in my side of my heart, you know, that, you know, being really lucky and, and feeling blessed that, you know, people, a lot of people gave me a chance. Frankie and, and Ronnie, different people that played the music, you know, in those earlier days against these big orchestral tracks and stuff. And you'd sing, okay, here's our little minuscule production and they're playing that against these things. Sure, right, right. You know, right. you know, that's, no, you know, I, I, again, look at some of the little no things and the blessing you know, that um, people gave you a chance. And I think that's where I'm open to giving a lot of artists a chance that I meet just on social media. Because that you was know, you, yeah. you know, because at one time somebody gave me a chance, you know, they, they didn't know about me or nothing, you know. But, right. you know, you can get it, strike up a general conversation with someone, even look at the way they word something and say, okay, I'm gonna give you a chance. And it's because somebody else gave me a chance. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly remembering mm. your 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 humble beginnings. That's that's mm. the thing. So, yeah. um, you've performed all over the world. I mean, you've been to every civilized city probably eight, ten times. Um, yes, I have. So some one story moments. you told me, and I and I said this is you know this is one of the many things that made me say, my God, we got to have a part two to this interview and a part three and the whole nine. Mm. Um, but one of the ones that I needed to get in this interview mm -hmm. is tell us the story about the um, portrait artist that um, mm -hmm. only did land, excuse me, the landscape artist that only did landscapes except for those, those three. And, and tell us, tell us how that story, tell us the story. About With it. the landscape know. artist, I don't remember this situation. Right. I'm start describing it to you and you stop me once this sounds familiar. There's mm -hmm. this guy who is a landscape artist, some mm -hmm. European dude, and his work goes, it starts at like a half a million bucks. Everybody is just like, he's the guy you want a landscape painted. Don't know, don't remember who this guy's name is. Anyway, you said he had three different entities that he wanted to sit for portraits. And he got oh, the, um, the artist from Austria that did the yeah, painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, he did the Dalai Lama, um, the Dalai Rolling Lama. Stones, and me, and, uh, and you know, my, my, my um, publisher has this painting now. Oh, what, really? <laughs> right, so I, I left it, and it was so on. huge that when I left England to come to Berlin, I didn't want a chance, well, I would have had to either take it down or 
if I'd have tried to travel with it, it would have been a van or something. So I just, I left it with um, my publisher there. So he has it in his house because I didn't want it to get destroyed. But again, that was a blessing. Um, and that evolved from um, um, over the years, I've always tried to do, um, uh, put myself in um, situations to do um, events for charities, different charities. Mm -hmm. And um, they recognized that in one of these events in Austria and had him come down and, and they, that was the surprise after the gig. Um, that he brought this big painting there, you know? So um, that's another blessed scenario that happened in my life. But that evolved from just doing charities and giving all the proceeds of charities, whether it was prostate cancer or whatever, um, mm -hmm. um, um, to the club to support those causes and stuff. And to date, I still do that. Um, I've done um, um, situations here, techno against um, malaria for African students and uh, uh, children. And the ch at one point, the children from Africa, they got together and they got a, 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 gave me a picture, uh, sent a picture back to me. Wait a minute, I can get the picture and at least show you the. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna tell part These of the- These are the little yeah, yeah, yeah. children from Africa that did this picture for me. Nice. Uh, because um, a few times I've, I've done a charities for malaria okay. for children over there. But in general, if anybody asks me to do kind of any, um, any um, charity event or something, I usually would say yes, you know, because okay. I think you should give a, a, a portion of yourself back to the system it, I, and I to show that it's not all about money, you know. Sure, sure. Well, and and in 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 keeping with that, um, the Modern Dance Music Research and Archiving mm -hmm. Foundation, my charity, um, mm -hmm. we definitely should do something in conjunction with one another. Because, okay, uh, I'm there and available. Yeah. Let me know. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I should not pass up an opportunity to send a little plug mm -hmm. out for us. Um, but so yeah, so this 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 landscape artist that normally mm -hmm. all he does is landscapes. Um, he had an opportunity to paint a, to do, he, he said he wanted three different um, entities to sit for a portrait and that's what he gave to charity. Is that what, that, is that the way that? No, he, the, the uh, Dalai Lama and um, Rolling Stones were the only two artists that he had, other artists that he had painted. Um, and I was the third, but he was a really huge artist there in Austria. That, you know, and I felt like I was really honored that they chose me to, to his third. Um, yeah, the Dalai Lama and the Rolling Stones. I mean, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's he was telling me, yeah, it's like, them. okay. But you know, no, it's a well, lot of beautiful things that's happened, you know, even performance wise, you know, being able to sing with um, a full orchestra, you know, a, a few times. Um, performing in Sydney Opera House twice, you know, as a house artist being there. Wow. Um, that's yeah. overwhelming, you know. Um, uh, even uh, some of the dates that I'm doing coming up um, in England is with a full orchestra, you know. Uh, and so that's a really an overwhelming thing. And just, you know, when you're there and on that experience, it's totally different, you know, because you have them in your ear with these, it's, it's a whole nother setup in a way of doing things from the live stage perspective. Um, and again, just the, you, the feeling you get from a crowd when you see all these thousands of people out there like that. What, what you, okay, um, so what's, what's the largest crowd you've ever performed for? If you can think um, of the number. Well, one of them would probably be the Exit Festival um, in Yugoslavia. It was probably over 100,000 people there. Huh. That's a big crowd. You know, That's and it's tents and stuff. But um, Glastonbury, um, um, at oh, yeah. any, the like last time I was there, it was over 250,000 people mm -hmm. there. And in the the event that I did, the, I did the inside thing with David Morales, um, the New York City download. Then I did the outside thing, which was over a few thousand people or something uh, inside this thing that looked like a fish tank or something. Uh, hmm. But God, I, I don't remember. I've done a lot of different things across Europe, a lot of big events in Europe, but definitely the um, the Exit Festival was probably one of the biggest ones. 
Okay. What's the tell me tell us about some of the most memorable performances? In and that say something like the the Sydney Opera House because mm -hmm. I've done inside the Opera House and then I've done outside the Opera House. Inside or outside? What's the difference? I'm, I've never Um the inside. outside is you you're near where the harbor and um mm, right, bridge right, and right. all of that is and what and you can see the other side. So um during the um was the vivid festival this light festival people are all on the outside around the whole opera house mm -hmm. plus you get people across the bridge so thousands of people could see you and i'm outside now so they can hear you and see you even if they're not inside the event and the last one was like that you know so um just the the energy level of what i felt from the crowd and everything they were right there um, with me every movement and everything you know so just the whole me DJing singing and everything you know it, it was real theatrical kind of scenario there with this one um, it, it's little clips on my Instagram page even okay. of, from a lot of these things and stuff so um, now you've got multiple different profiles on Instagram which one is the one that this is Robert at? Owens this is Robert Owens. That's the yeah. right one, correct? Yes. Okay. And if you go down it, you'll see loads of clips and different things from um, events here and there. I try to do little live snippets here and there of um, different things. Okay. But yeah, some, uh, the Opera House was probably one of my memorable ones. Even being in South Africa is another really, and I've been there a few times. Um, okay. um, the first time, God, I just broke down and cried from the, um, the love that you felt from people there, you know, um, sure. you know, it was really, really overwhelming, um, you know, because you, you look at the history of um, the way people talk about Africa and different things. And often you just hear and see the negative side of things, but going there and meeting people, you know, it was just this pure love and overwhelming that you were there, you know. Um, Very cool. No, I've heard people have emotional experiences and, and, feeling feeling that that, that that particularly performing in south africa yeah um, yeah i even went into the like the shanty towns all kind of places mm -hmm. even i've stayed a few days extra and um the last time i went into like this area they took me in this area and like every um maybe 20 yards of well, they get out the car and people remember me from the performance and they run up oh there they go and, and i'd <laughs> sit and talk to them and you know they all call the neighbors and stuff and you had all of these people coming around and stuff and they call the neighbors yeah That's they call cool. the neighbors and then we sit down and we chatted every while and talk for a minute then we get in the car go a little bit down the yeah, same thing people come out and stuff hey and want to take pictures with you and stuff and it's even That's a few cool. video clips and stuff of that on um the instagram okay. and things and like these moments it's like where you really treasure something because it wasn't just about you being there and performing you really got to know some of the native culture of people there sure. and, and how they felt right and this extends to the way i i write and think about writing and stories you know someone could have told me a a, a a positive story or a melancholy kind of situation and and i'll remember that and i'll go back and write about that Hmm, sure. You know, right, right, this right. is where you, you, you figure a lot of your things is you're staying human. Right. And, and, and down the earth to life. And you, you're writing about circumstances that maybe not just you've experienced, but you're also staying aware of what other people are dealing with. Sure. Absolutely. And you're also being able to use the stories that you pick up along your way on the road to mm be able to tell other people's stories and and, yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. and reflect their experience and yeah. give them a voice, so to speak. Yeah. When you and let them know that they're not alone, you know, to exactly. also some people feel like they might be alone and they're sitting there struggling with this situation all by themselves. But it's also, it's, no, you're not alone. Or, you know, I might have experienced the same way, the same situation, but here's a way out. Sure, exactly, exactly. You know, so and often I might good, come good, in good, with a good, sad good, viewpoint, good, you know? but I try to give you a way out too to say, okay, you might have went through that. Well, let's try this angle. And often I, I've always said, even to friends here, you know, it's like, it's not telling someone how to do something, but if I can ask you to look at something, 
let's view this situation together, I automatically yeah, take you out of the mode of even want to be confrontational or, or feeling threatened by someone trying to express how to do something. I've asked you to just look at something different from a different viewpoint. Right, right, right. And also, it shows that you connect with people and shows mm. that you can understand their their situation, their story. And mm. just by nature of that, by virtue of that, people feel less alone because somebody mm -hmm. gets that. Mm -hmm. you feel. So, you mm -hmm. know, being able to utilize that, write stories to tell those tales, mm -hmm. that's a big thing. You know, mm -hmm. all these songs come from somewhere. Yeah, yeah we're all interconnected and from one um, extent or something, you know, um, we're all there together. So you, ha you have to make people, and also, it's also helping me. Maybe it, it might be a point where I'm struggling with something and me opening up and telling you may be re-securing, uh, you know, my whole thought of getting myself back together, like brush yourself off, get it's back not. up. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can you can make it through this thing too. You know, yeah, even a friend of mine called me today from Chicago to saying something like re relate to that and say, "No, he's like you got to remember all of these stories. You better you telling other people. You got to use some of that in your life." Sure, right, absolutely. <laughs> he's like a little brother there, and he's calling me, we talking about hmm. things. And I was like, "Yeah, you're right." Mm -hmm. So, when's the last time you were back in Chicago? I'm curious. God, when was the last? It's been a long time. Um, probably the last time when I was over doing the interview with you was the last time wow, I was yeah. there. Okay, wow. Yeah. That's been like three years, four, something. It's a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and then I was coming back and then the whole pandemic thing broke out. Got it. And right. then they locked down Berlin so we couldn't leave out. Now that, yeah, it stifled travel worldwide. Yeah, um, yeah, we, everything just what, froze. What, what, what made you want to move there, and um, how do you find the 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 environment and the and the culture? Well, I was actually in Chicago thinking about staying there when you see me, and I, I was there, and then but um um I'm still managed by England, so um I had dates mm -hmm. and stuff booked up, and legally um I needed to come back and do some of those dates oh, because okay. they were contracted. And yeah. so they, they're saying, well, you can't, it's like, it's too much of uh, stress for you to be based in sh Chicago and fly back and forth like that. When you have like three or four dates here um, at a time, because usually mm -hmm. sometimes they would book me out Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and, and you just mm -hmm. fly from one city to the next city. And, and um, I was um, just was having problems with London. Um, it, it's not necessary to go through the whole drama, of it, but I was having problems with London um, and from one perspective or another. And um, so they've said, well, you still got to stay somewhere in Europe. And so I was like, um, well, the choices was either Paris or Berlin. And I love Paris um, uh, and I like Berlin, but I had a a few more friends here in Berlin. Okay. It was like, oh, you got to come here and stay with us and all of that. And I was like, okay. So I ended up with um, um, Berlin. Okay. Okay. You know, and it's close. And again, you're only um, one or two hours away from most places in sure. Europe right. being based right. here. Um, um, now let me so answer just this. ended up being Berlin and, and then um, finding out that so many club opportunities are here. Um, it's just overwhelming. I start. I probably played every club here, and oh, I've wow, been man. a resident of like at least three or four clubs here. Um, even when the whole pandemic thing broke out, I was one of the first artists that all the clubs called to come and do live streams, really? and it was like, wow, that's like really that showed me the love that's Absolutely. felt for me here in Berlin, you know. And um, I got out there, and I was like, okay, I'm coming. Uh, right, Y'all right. need me, I'm here and I'm coming and um, I've done every club. And, and I think that really reinforces the love and unity, unification between me and the people here. Did I, I, I've always been that truth, trooper. I've been that soldier that, okay, I come to the, y'all want me on the front line. I'm ready. Let's go. Oh, let's do on. this. Cool. So you know, I've got, so. A, I got a question for you. I'm um, considering that you both DJ and perform. Have mm -hmm. you found that you've gotten bookings to do kind of a back-to-back -back show? You, they want you to sing however many tracks, and then also you, you spin. 
Um, it depends on the situation, but to remember, even um, back in this Freetown period, I had 11 piece band. Oh, shit. So I've had dates where I would first I'd perform with the band mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. I go and I DJ oh, because nice. then yeah, throughout yeah. Europe, they know I do both. Okay. Um, but I've always wanted to revisit that whole thing of the live um, perspective from that viewpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had smaller band setups, too. And again, we would do the live performance with the band and then I do the DJ um, right, session right. right after that. And, and your taste and, in music is is impeccable. I mean, that was um, like right actually around the same time that I, I found out that, you know, when when when, mm -hmm. when you were when you came on the scene as a vocalist and, and, we, mm -hmm. and we developed a friendship. Um, I also right around that same time heard a, some uh, a tape or two of yours. And I was like, yo, dude can spin. <laughs> you know, you played some cuts <laughs> that turned me on to songs that I was like, they've been there, but what? This yeah. is the first guy that I'm hearing playing them. Oh, um, like past the buck, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You got good taste in music, dude. You, 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 it, oh, the vocal you. thing didn't just come from nowhere, you mm -hmm. know. And I still do that live on the shows, even spinning. You know, I start with it. Hey, da da da. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, people? <laughs> and then uh, I sing a little bit throughout the uh, DJ performance here and there. And it's a lot of live streams, even again, um, if you go down the Facebook and uh, pages and stuff, it's lots of links to uh, a lot of the live streams and stuff that I'm doing and done throughout Germany and stuff of uh, over this whole pandemic period. Sure. Um, but I enjoyed it too. And then some, even like with the London, it's a couple of dates where they just want me to come as the performer and do the stage thing. Okay. Well, one, uh, a big thing that I'm, a summer of love or something there that I'm doing with, um, um, Richard Westminster C and a, a bunch of artists okay. from probably the early 80s period or something, you know, so sure. that one, um, I'm just doing the singing and then um, it's one where the Jacksons are going to be on, Shalimar, oh, and wow. all of this, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, sing on that one on the stage with the 50 piece orchestra Jordan and Wildman then and, and the after party, I'll DJ for the after party. Very and, cool. You know, yeah, so it's nice that you just, that because yeah. they know that I do both. They yeah. always give me that option to do um, the two things now and okay. throughout Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that that would be a kind of a cool little combo. Hey, we got him. He does both. Let's mm -hmm. get him. To do both. Why not? Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, God, there's so much. I mean, like I said, you've just got stories upon stories and, 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 they, and they just keep coming and the things that anybody else, even people who are seasoned people in the industry, they would just like jump to like, yo, I got to tell you this story about, <laughs> just like, oh, you know. And then there was the time the Queen of England and I went out and got Cheetos, you know, and it's just, you know, and you're well, like. Well, I have what? stories about princes and all of this stuff. Of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, know, it's not you know, going into all of this stuff. Of. Yeah, with, with Again, it's just about... grateful to be evolving and that you've given me this opportunity to talk with you again you know like, in touch you know as i said we're we're gonna have to do this is part two or three we are mm -hmm. going to most certainly have gonna have to do this again because that's the other thing you keep working you know yeah. like you said yeah. you're you know from the next few ball. days you're gonna be yeah. in the studio and yeah. that being said by mm -hmm. the time we talk to you next time you will have many more things that you yeah. have done and 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 you know be able to bring us up and from a global perspective constantly trying to reach out and connect with all different cultures from around the world and, and you know that's a part of uh, my little tiny bit of trying to bring us together and again saying that we're connected you know we're yeah. we're all from one perspective the same you know we we're reaching for the same thing what uh, uh, from a perspective, you know, and for me, it's happiness, you know, um, whatever you're trying to achieve in your life, you know, the root of it should be to get to that point of just being happy. Sure. Now, what I'm going to need for you to do is send mm -hmm. me, I don't know, five or 10 things that are reasonably current that you kind of mm -hmm. want the world to know about because yeah, and i don't yeah. want you to you know labels like you didn't send mine and you know you know look <laughs> you're gonna have to pick you know the things that you 
throw me under the bus. I said mm. the things that I thought would be Charlie's favorites, you know. Uh, so okay. You can do that. Well, I'll put you together a we transfer package and send That's it the to answer. you. Send me some stuff yeah. because I'm mm. going to, since we're pre-recording this, so that we wouldn't mm. have you up at some ungodly hour trying to do this interview at, you know, three mm. or four in the morning. Because, yeah, at first you said three or something in the morning. I was like, I probably would be woke. But, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe I'm not. It depends on the night before. Exactly. So. And you, I, you know, we're, we're not trying to get you at your sort of maybe your, you know, not necessarily <laughs> your best, but you're okay ish, you know. So, uh, with that being said, uh, we wanted to make this convenient for you and, and so pre record the interview. Yeah, um, thank you. But due to that, uh it's a little bit more difficult to play stuff so like i said i'm gonna need mm -hmm. you to put that package together so that yeah, i can do that over the coming day on what you're working on most currently and mm -hmm. what you have going on yeah okay yeah um that's right. uh, definitely part of uh what the show we want it to be about we want to look do a mm -hmm. retrospective of artists mm -hmm. that have done significant work in the industry mm -hmm. and then say all right well cool now that we've talked about where you came from if you have any cool interesting stories you want to share or, you know mm -hmm. here's the inside this that or the other thing on the making of mm -hmm. this or that period in my life um mm -hmm. then that's a good opportunity but then also yeah. it's a good chance for you to say this is what i've been doing lately so mm -hmm. um anything not necessarily of of, of of most current work but any stories mm -hmm. that you know for this part two or three interview mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you kind of want to make sure you get in there that mm -hmm. uh you know until until the next time we talk mm -hmm. anything you got for well us? one thing if a lot if anyone can catch a, a um any of the links that i said some of them are there listed on the like the facebook page um okay of, any of the live streams, you'll hear loads of uh, material that I'm always playing unreleased material there. Some of it may be released stuff. now, but uh, uh, lots of demos I, I play there, you know. And usually I might play the, the original demo that I did because I always give people a composite structure of a vocal mm, okay. from my um, viewpoint before sending it to the artist. And then they may dissect it after they get it. But the first initial orchestration of something is my viewpoint of how it should be. And a lot of those um, patterns are in my live stream. Okay. And that's where I enjoy also being able to play music, you know, because I then I can play things that other people don't have or versions that other people don't have. You know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, so yeah, if you can send us some of those links to different things, that mm -hmm. would be helpful because we're putting together a Facebook channel, not Facebook, um, a YouTube channel mm -hmm. for any rebroadcasting of shows. And mm -hmm. so in the comment section or whatever's below the video, we can definitely mm -hmm. put, you know, here, here are the links that Robert was talking about mm -hmm. to his Facebook page for unreleased stuff and whatever other stuff that you've got for us. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be more than happy to let the world, you know, turn mm -hmm. the world on to that. But uh, okay. what I was going to ask you about is, um, before we let you go, if you mm -hmm. could talk a little bit about the creative process, mm -hmm. what does it look like when you are working on a song and mm -hmm. working with an artist, whether it's something that, mm -hmm. in fact, if you could tell us both routes, mm -hmm. when you are writing for somebody and mm -hmm. they're saying, hey, I want to record this that you've written, and then mm -hmm. you say, I'm working on something that I want to record mm -hmm. using your voice for them. Mm -hmm. Which, what do those two things look like? Well, in most cases, people don't meet me um, physically in person. You know, everything has been done over digitally. So they may send me just a, a rough draft of an instrumental track. Okay. And, and from that, I'll listen to it. And then I, I make up instant melodies of um, what, how I want the backing vocals and the lead part to be. Okay. Um, I just get my root on that and then I'll write the song. And I might write maybe um, four or five verses, but I'll end up with just two or something. It sure. depends. And if I've had a conversation with the artist and they've given me a kind of idea of like, okay, I don't want too much vocal or I want a full story um, from that, then out of what I've written, then I just develop those areas and then this is where i'm saying i structure a composite vocal thing for them where it might start with um an intro of talking then i'll move into a chorus section that i've developed and usually i shape maybe two or three different chorus ideas and then play set them throughout the song so um it varies here and there 
Okay. Um, but all of that structure with me and an engineer here in Berlin, you know, mm -hmm. I have a, a engineer named Jamie Anderson here that um, has a really nice studio. Um, and I, he knows me and we've grown and developed. He even said as a child, he dreamed about working with me. Oh, <laughs> so wow. it, was, it was funny that we ended up together. And I was like, that's amazing. And, you know, so mm -hmm. now he's like, uh, the main person that I just work with with vocals because we understand each other. When I say something about I want something a certain way, it's instant and he can get to it. And um, I'm really fast when I'm in a studio environment and working on something because you're on a time limit. People are paying for this yes. session and stuff. So I have hour. to deliver. Somebody asked me, well, aren't you afraid you're not going to come up? I was like, no, you're, this, this is like a job. You know, if you're an employee, yeah, you have to come up with something. As a lawyer, you have to know what you're doing and to complete the cases in different situations. You can't go in with the under the viewpoint, I think I can do this. You know your stuff. <laughs> I, I know, <laughs> yeah, I know what I can give you. I'm not trying to give you nobody else. I can give, but I can give you Robert Owens. Yeah, you right. know, and so either you're gonna like it or you're not. And it's so I don't go in with like over guessing or rethinking things. You know, I have a set format and structure of how to develop something and backing vocals, starting with a root vocal and then triggering off um, to um, maybe first, second tenors. I know the different ranges and stuff, alto, contralto, baritones, mm -hmm. sopranos, all of that. I, I could be the choir because I've sung in choirs and stuff, but just mm -hmm. in general, by ear, I know what things sound like and how they should sound correct. And probably that stems from working with bands too. And mm -hmm. even when I had the in-house, um, band for the record label and stuff working with those session musicians and engineers and stuff it was points where i would correct things instantly by ear that they where they went off and mm -hmm. some of these people were classically trained so it's it's also almost knowing without knowing and even these right. points where people told me like um i thought about what do you think i should get a lesson and they said well no it might take away your natural ability to recognize things. And this was coming from trained people, you know, that I was working with. And I think that's just a locked memory of working with some really great people. Sure, right, right. You know, on how to do that. But I, I, I got a set viewpoint on how to go in and do something and structure and develop things. And then from another perspective, you're saying, if I'm going in to develop music or something for another artist or something like this young, guy got in touch with me on Instagram and he was like, he, he writes and he wants to meet me and he was here in Berlin. And so um, I met him for a coffee one day and I looked at some of his lyrical content and I was like, okay, we can reshape this a little bit. And I, I got to know him and I asked him about things that inspired him. Uh, what was he looking for um, his actual lyrical content to sound like as a song? And, you know, I listened to all of his thoughts. Then I took him into a session and um, he actually wanted me to sing the song. And I was like, no, I'm gonna get you to sing your song. <laughs> and so I, I developed him in from verse to verse. Mm -hmm. I, I let him sing it and then I sung it to him how he should sing it. And yeah. then we got him to keep singing it over and over and correcting him, uh, singing just different wording and things and then um, played it back to him and he was shocked. Um, but I've done, even in the Freetown period, I've sat there with artists on the other side of the glass, mouthing the parts to them from right. every verse down, you know. So I'm, I've worked with different artists and, and to that close point of, you know, word by word. Hmm. You okay. sing it, I sing it back to you to just get them the feeling of how I, I, I thought that they should convey this thought across. Sure. Um, and then musically, so the vocal, I've, I've, the vocal I, arrangement you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, from the musical content, I've said, even with this guy again, I said, and um, I listened to, I started with um, just some loops with me and the engineer. And then mm -hmm. I picked a, a few different loops that I thought was a good groove. And exactly. then we took elements of those loops and exactly. then made a, a little composite piece. 
Okay. And and then from there we created a bass line. Some things I hum the parts of them by me singing. I could sing you the boop 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 mm -hmm. boop 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 whatever melody that I'm thinking about, and and then we can play it in. Some things I if I take a little time, I'm I'm not a trained musician, but I can make up and play little melodies mm -hmm. by myself, mm -hmm. so I can get the root of something started. And we did that with him. We got the root of something started from. Uh, a few little pieces like that bass line, a couple little string elements and stuff to give him just a pad of to sing over. And it was like, let me just get you sectioned in these, shaped in these parts. Mm -hmm. Then later we'll um, do a little bit more for the music, but for the original format, we just need a bass root something. Once we get you in singing and, and doing the melodies the way I'm, I'm shaping, I'm hearing it and stuff, we can even do more music around your voice melodies right, right. and, you know, triggering the keys like that. And a lot of people do that with me. So it's like, uh, mm -hmm. you got these different ways of approaching Sure. Some, but usually Effort. when you're working with writing a full scope of something with an artist, it's good to just do a root something and not just hmm. um, I see. be like, I got to get a full song out of this right away. Okay. You know, and Effort again, for, for because people. you're dealing on a time frame, you know, where this session may be four hours and you mm -hmm. say, okay, how am I going to break the two hours max? Let's spend on the music, mm -hmm. the other two mm -hmm. hours vocals, and right. then we can come back. You can reassess what what was where, done where, where you are then yeah where you're at right. and stuff yeah so for people who don't know what a vocal arrangement is so again i try to bring people into the conversation mm -hmm. um the best example that i come up with is the song thriller just because so many people know thriller right mm -hmm. so it, we all know that it's just a thriller thriller mm -hmm. not you know yeah. that's the way it goes mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it could have been it's just a thriller thriller night it mm. could have been it could have gone a completely different way mm. but the fact that they liked it's just a thriller is the way mm. that they ended up saying we like this vocal arrangement the best mm. this is the one we're going to use mm. um so that's what we were you were talking about when you're saying you're working with artists the, and the, the full arrangement of um the full song that, that that's that's more like a phrase part mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'm talking about when you're just arranging the way that the vocal is going to rep represent that song, the way that the chorus is going to be, the way that yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, that, that's a part. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I, 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 I was looking at the whole overall arrangement. But yeah, you're explaining yeah. just a, like a second. Yeah, no, I was just talking yeah, about yeah. when I mentioned when I used that term vocal arrangement. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was just kind of oh, explaining yeah, yeah. if anybody's like, yeah. what did he just say? You know. Um, <laughs> And yeah, sometimes I'll be going fast. Like in the yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's good that you're breaking it down in there. I do skip past the whole process of the full scope of the thought of what I'm talking about. So. No, absolutely. No, I mean, it's just it's one of those things that, because um, I've, I've been writing songs since I was in high school. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and, and I've been producing since, I don't know, 90 something. Anyway, bottom line is I can talk with people who do that stuff in a certain language yeah that yeah that people they may be watching it, this yeah, interview yeah, yeah. it may go over their head and i'm not trying yeah. to i'm trying to bring them in so that yeah, we can all yeah. be having the same thank thing. you for that yeah, yeah. um mm -hmm. yeah dude we could talk for a while mm -hmm. and and look up and you know six hours have gone by um mm -hmm. like i said anything else that you think the world needs to know until the next uh -huh. time we get a chance to talk um, that with, I'm hoping that, to well, get well, to well, Chicago well, like years uh, before, which you know it shouldn't be half a damn decade. That's not cool. Uh, yeah, I'm um, just uh, hoping to get to Chicago and perform there, you know, um, for people and just to see some friends, you know. Um, right. Um, but because I talk to mothers, my mother there, and uh, friends off and on, but it's not the same as physically being there. You know, I really would love to physically come there. I've come that way, um, but it's been mainly um california and new york they before things broke out they booked me all the time in california new york and the last time in florida uh, st petersburg florida I, I never even knew that existed okay, yeah i think the dolly museum is there that's like it was amazing it was an amazing event yeah it was really really nice um but new york um uh, they they still they book me um a lot of the standard hotel i'll do that and then mm -hmm. i'll do the standard in la and a, a few other events i did a really underground event um in um 
LA before this pandemic broke out and it was really good. It was and surprising because years ago when I stayed in LA, probably um, when Ronnie had left and came back to Chicago for the first time, I think I went back out there. They were a little kind of behind with the music, but they were really up for it um, in LA. And it was maybe because it was an underground thing. It was like a warehouse that they had cleaned out and put their lights in, sound system. When is this? Oh, God. It was, um, it right was before the pandemic. First, I went to New York, yeah. and I did City Sound something on there. Okay. This big, huge venue, I think, is you could, it's maybe a... The biggest thing I knew about in L.A. was um, Deep, um, you know. Um, but Marcus played this event with me. Oh, okay. Okay. He yeah, was yeah. me and him were the DJs for the event, but it was it was it wasn't a deep event. Um, it was I can't remember their name right off. Um, God, what are these people's name? I see. I'm getting old. I forget. These. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was well, I mean, the last two big YouTube things that I did were like New York is, and you know it's it's it there's there's there's, there's so much mm -hmm. there's so much. and tried to get to Chicago but they they were having problems I was trying to get there to do the spy bar but uh they didn't connect in with the people but that, again these managements and um booking agents and stuff having problems with each other um and sure. so it just didn't happen but um fingers crossed and I, I went there before to do this thing with um um the hot mix five and then when they did some big thing at this big complex okay. and that was a disaster um uh, but um um hopefully we'll get it together next time i come that way definitely definitely mm -hmm. um and you know next time you come this way we'll have to do this 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 part three or four interview in person yeah, yeah. yeah. And it'll be hopefully lots more work and stuff there with more artists, you know, because I'm here, available and ready. God, dude, it's like a fountain have... flowing. Yeah, yeah. You 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 get more work than some people. You get more work in a year than some people get in their entire <laughs> careers. You know, um, and and, that, and that's a blessing. You know, but it couldn't. It couldn't. It, it, more that that kind of work could not go to a better guy. You know. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, anything else you got for us that, like I said, you, you need for the world to know? Um, that I love you all. Uh, and I'm uh, grateful for all of you. And I'm here. You. And love you. I, I hope I stay you. there in your yeah. hearts, wherever you are. And grateful is the grateful is exactly the way that I would put it. We are grateful to have <laughs> you around and the body of work. He said, God, more than a thousand songs. That is just yeah. staggering. Staggering is the word that I would use. Um, yeah, there's a lot right. that's not even listed, I think, on the whole, but definitely there's a lot that's not listed on the whole discography, and there's a lot that's not released, it's just there waiting, you know, uh, and that's why I said, like, on some of the live streams, you can hear demos and stuff that are there and may not never come out. Um, but I, I have a, a huge, huge yeah. body of work that's not even released, this yeah, company's that's just a... setting up, but... It's, you know, you, you're managed and stuff and you're working with different companies and stuff. So you have to like listen to them. And sometimes I think they think I'm going too fast or something. It's like, oh, but you should only do this. Like, but what am I waiting for? Tomorrow's not promised to no one. Absolutely. It's about what you do right now and you give back to humanity that really matters. You have to um, get to that stage and point in your life as an artist. At least that's, again, one of my viewpoints and perspectives that I can offer to anyone. You should you know, once you, you, and, you, and know, don't, you don't don't get to the level of you, where you want to create and you want to give that back to humanity and people enjoy that, you know, you should push and push and give as much as you can give. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Don't listen to them when they tell you to slow down. Tell them to speed mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, the uber, uber, uber talented Robert Owens. Thank you, sir. Thank you both. Thank mm -hmm. you so very much, Robert. Okay, all right, thank again. you. All right, and bye-bye. <laughs> hey, we are back. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Robert. Um, I, I told you, he's got a lot of stories. Um, he's just lived a ridiculously exceptional life. 
Um, now we're going to play a segment from Rhonda Flowers um, and her uh, journey in house music. So let's, let's jump into that. Hi, my name is Rhonda Flowers, Chicago's Queen of House Music Promotions. Remember I mentioned last month about the party scene as a young girl in elementary school in 1977 and how we were all invited when we received an index card with the who, what, when, and where on it. Well, as a young promoter, that's how it began. So within another two or three years, my friends who were older started quickly wanting to hit the party scene. So here we go. Oh yes, with the skate parties, with the great music, and a sport that everyone loves. And the best sound music that you can be proud of. It was pumped. It was a cool place to be if you enjoyed skating and the people watching. It was a fun party and we were all in our skates and we decked them out and we were proud to carry our skates on our shoulders walking to the skating rink. Yeah, those were the good days. And then the parties at the Catholic high schools. Oh, let's not forget that in the Catholic high schools. They were created. What a relief. Okay, at least for me that is. I didn't have to skate anymore and go around in circles. So, talking about disco, oh, the high school parties were the disco scene. Uh, there was a place in Chicago called the Mendo High School. Mendo High School started off with the house music parties. They were great. More or less, we would call them disco, at least back then. So now we're getting somewhere in the late 70s and 80s. This is where I saw the DJs on a stage with huge speakers and loud music. It was awesome. <laughs> this is the party where mostly high school kids gathered for dance parties. Everyone was there that was cool. And the biggest, greatest part was our parents were not there. But the late 70s and 80s wasn't so easy as a promoter. It was uncommon for people like me to want to break into the party industry alone. Most promoters back then were in groups. It was really cool to form a party organization from school peers because it drew more people and attention. Groups and organizations formed their own promotional companies within their high school or neighborhood. They wore t-shirts, hats, bandanas, even colors um, that represented their group. It was cool you would take a chance on wearing your gear, but the local gangs uh, kind of changed that, according to the police. Chicago wasn't easy. The gangs grew strong and the violence increased. But there was some good in Chicago, not to mention people played Pac-Man, The Taste of Chicago was out, of course the Blues Brothers movies was a big hit, and Superman, yes, climbed up the Willis Tower. And life was moving. Everyone's in high school, and for a quick moment we had to move it back inside, at least on the south side. This is when it happened. The keg parties and the smokeouts was another beginning of my chapter. So stay tuned for chapter three of my story. Until next time, I'm Rhonda Flowers, queen of Chicago's house music promotions. Thank you for watching Schoolhouse School is in Session with Lori Branch and Charles Matlock. Hey, um, okay, and we're back. So, um, yeah, uh, what was I gonna say? <laughs> um, uh, I really hope you enjoyed the show. Interviewing Robert was great. It's uh, always a good time to talk to my friend and kind of catch up, and, but it's nice to be able to share, uh, you know, our friendship and, and conversations with others. And, um, you know, and I get to ask them questions that people may want the answers to. And sometimes I don't have the answers to. Um, it was the, the, the I, one thing that there was a highlight that I can remember from the um, interview was the revelation that the reason that a lot of demo things sounded so good and so raw and then they you know ended up doing another version that was in a bigger studio and more polished and it ended up being just not the same fucking groove that you know really hit you and made you made the dance floor irresistible um and you know he said 
we were just figuring shit out, you know, we didn't know how to use these machines. And so the first time around, we were lucky enough to capture it, but we couldn't tell you how we got back there. We didn't know that the machines that well. So, you know, somebody will else would say, I love this song. Let's go do it in the studio. And can you make it just like that? And he's like, no, not really. And then they would end up making a new version that just didn't have that same fire. So, um, yeah, I've been in the business for a really long time. I've seen a lot of stuff. And like I said, Frankie was my mentor. So I really got bird's eye view on many things. But I still there's there's there are things that I learn, you know, so that's why I wanted to do a show um, to kind of educate, bring people into the conversation because it's interesting. You know, the fact the putting aside the rock star nature of DJs and producers and shit like that, it's just the interesting kind of slice of life stories that you know, you get people to share their lives with you. So, um, and they've been pretty interesting lives. So all that being said, uh, that's, that was kind of the impetus for the show. I hope you enjoyed it and, um, we will see you next month.